न्यू सर्विसेज डिविजन ऑफ ऑल इंडिया रेडियो प्रेजेंट्स अ स्पेशल प्रोग्राम कमेमोरेटिंग द फिफ्थ एनिवर्सरी ऑफ द इंडियन विक्ट्री ओवर पाकिस्तान इन 1971 एंड लिबरेशन ऑफ बांग्लादेश The great poet Thomas Campbell wrote Few should part while many meet The snow should be the winding sheet and every turf beneath their feet shall be a soldier's sepulcher Fifty years ago The Indian Army found an implacable foe in the land of the numerable rivers, marshes, and ponds. At the end of that struggle, he had been defeated, and the new nation Bangladesh, the land of Bangla, was born. And the fairy tale of a nation based on religion was forever shattered. In 1970 the Pakistan army decided to step down from power and announced elections the Awami League under its leader Sheikh Mujibur Rahman swept the polls in East Pakistan but the military junta was unwilling to transfer power to him in a historic address at the Dhaka race course in early 1971 Mujibur Rahman promised them a new country a country where the bengali would not be subject to the punjabi or the pathan sangram amar mukti sangram ebare sangram ayar sangram ay rama koti tarike assembly call koreche rastek bhag chudai nai ami dosh tarike es bole diyechi je oi koire rastur porte para diye aaj krishite modur amar jogdan korte pare na His countrymen took a bounce to realize his dream and the Mukti Bahini and the Mukti Forge were born the military junta and West Pakistan appointed general Tikka Khan as administrator in East Pakistan and he organized a brutal crackdown even so the Pakistan army lost ground and when the monsoon broke out early that year The Mukti Forge controlled large areas in the waterlogged countryside. Once the monsoon ended, the military reorganized itself and by September had retaken all the territory. The freedom fighters crossed the border and took shelter in India, and an estimated 10 million people took refuge in India in camps along the border. Indian public opinion was aroused by tales of massacres and rapes while it was clear that the government could not afford the cost of looking after the refugees skirmishes between the border security force and the pakistan army began gradually both countries began inching towards the war General Jagjit Singh Arora who was to be later in charge of the operation recalls the planning was done in good time because we had the time and the second thing is that uh, we realized that unless we achieve success in the shortest possible time the united nation and the other major nations would like to try us from carrying on fighting as a ceasefire rather than giving us time to have proper victory but we didn't want anything less than victory i evolved that we should be able to surprise and we should also be able to have mobility now the communications were very sparse chief of army staff general sam manikshaw was firm that adequate preparations had to be made 
before the Indian Army could move into East Pakistan. A commanding and independent personality, he convinced Prime Minister Indira Gandhi that she should wait till the army was fully ready. Field Marshal Manik Shaw. In the 1971 conflict, the operations were planned, planned in the minutest detail. From the time that Yahya Khan crashed down on East Pakistan and refugees started pouring in, we knew that we would have to do something so that the refugees could go back. Now, when to do it was the question. It could have been done earlier on in, October, in April or May, but we were not ready. I had to concentrate my troops. The monsoon was about to break. The Himalayan passes would be open and I would have to look at the Chinese front. The Indian Army won the first front even before the war had officially begun. On the 21st of November, at Boira, it repulsed the Pakistan incursion, destroying several tanks. Three American-built Sabre fighters were shot down by Indian maps in the sky above as thousands of villagers watched. On the 3rd of December, Pakistan declared war and its air force attacked forward Indian Air Force bases at 5.20 in the evening, hoping to catch the fighters on the ground, but the attack failed. The Prime Minister, who was in Calcutta, flew back to Delhi and addressed the nation at midnight. I speak to you at a moment of grave peril to our country and our people. Some hours ago, soon after 5.30 p.m. on the 3rd of December, Pakistan launched a full-scale war against us. The Pakistan Air Force suddenly struck at our airfield in Amritsar, Pathankot, Srinagar, Avantipur, Uttarlai, Jodhpur, Ambala and Agra. I have no doubt that it is the united will of our people that this wanton and unprovoked aggression of Pakistan should be decisively and finally repelled. The Indian Air Force attacked Tejgao and Kurmitola air fuel bases the same night, causing heavy damage. <laughs> air Marshal H.C. Vivan planned the attacks. The Air Force bombed each and every airfield, whether in use or out of use, in Pakistan, East Pakistan. And every airfield was immobilized. Once it was immobilized, they were just not able to take off. We dared them, more or less, to really fly over some of their military airfield, which was primarily in Dhaka, Tezgaon, but they did not come up because they realized that the Air Force was quite superior in, uh, to them. The next day, the Soviet Union vetoed a resolution at the United Nations Security Council calling for a ceasefire. Major General Dalbir Singh, commanding the Indian 9th Infantry, began heavy shelling of the defences around Jessor, an important town on the East Pakistan border. By the 5th of December, Darshana, Thakurgaon, Kamalpur and Akura had fallen and the Indian Air Force was continuing massive round-the-clock attacks on Dhaka. General Arora. The Air Force promised us to give favorable air situation, which they achieved within the first 36 to 48 hours, and kept the enemy practically grounded. And they were able to give us a certain amount of support to make up uh, for the uh, heavy artillery, and, and because it was not possible on these byways, to be able to carry very heavy uh, uh, weapons either. By this time, the civilian population of Dhaka had streamed away, leaving it a ghost city. By the 6th of December, all sectors were under pressure from the Indian Army and East Pakistan was completely blockaded from both sea and air. Vice Admiral Mihir Kumar Roy, who played a crucial role, says, so In 71, we had the blockade. We prevented any of the ships and prisoners moving out by the calls, etc., because we had aircraft that operated at night. And when I spoke to Admiral Sharif when he was a prisoner in Fort William, and he said, I was deaf, I was blind, 
because day and night the navy hammered us in all the inside calls etc leading to the seas the pakistani air force was completely grounded from the evening of that day by now jessor had fallen indira gandhi announced in parliament that india was recognizing bangladesh the people of bangladesh battling for their very existence and the people of india fighting to defeat aggression now find themselves partisans in the same cause the government of india have after the most careful consideration decided to grant recognition to by the 7th of december indian troops started chasing the retreating pakistanis to khulna they encountered heavy resistance and khulna held out till the end of the war on the previous day 41 mountain brigade had taken janaida another important town by surprise on the eastern sector general sagat of the 4th corps bypassed the fortified town of kamila and made a dash for chandpur and dorkandi the then chief of eastern command lieutenant general jfr jacob we planned the campaign in such a manner so that we'd be move fast and we would suffer the minimum casualties to do this we at eastern command selected our main objective to be dacca and we then selected subsidiary objectives to assist in this they were not towns but communication centers and command and control centers for example in the western sector we selected magura farida and faridpur in the eastern sector we selected chandpur and daud kandi this was to be the overall pattern of the indian march to dhaka wherever they encountered they prepared defensive positions they bypassed them and advanced general arora recalls we planned that we are going to try and bypass the major defenses by using not the main road but the small road the by road you know and this why i said leave the highways and follow the byways and we prepared our troops to be able to move self contained we had some tanks russian tanks that could swim we made good use of them and for cr- river crossing similarly for the first time we used helicopters for river crossing the east pakistan governor sent a message the same day to president yahya khan beseeching him to start negotiations by the 8th of december when general gonsalves had reached the meghna river at ashuganj the road to dhaka lay open on the other side of the river on the western side on the 9th of december karachi harbor was set ablaze by indian missile boats the famous attack was a major psychological blow as vice admiral mihir roy recounts we took no one's permission but missile karachi and more than karachi the kamari oil tanks which really made the shortage of fuel besides that it broke the morale of the pakistan navy and the people in karachi on the western front the pakistani attack on poonch failed and their 18th division in rajasthan suffered a debacle the great crossing of the meghna now began the bridge there had been destroyed by retreating troops and over the next 36 hours mi4 helicopters airlifted troops and put them on the other side at narsingri air marshal divan i told them that i can airlift some troops with a very very few or rather a handful of helicopters which are located in the eastern sector i had also told them that uh, this uh, is not a very uh, normal routine because our pilots have not flown at night and helicopters are very vulnerable to even a small arms fire from the enemy so i told them that it is a very hazardous operation the little population there and the mukti bahini also helped with boats general arora we had with mukti bhaini 
been able to achieve favorable situation as far as the civilian population is concerned. So wherever we went, they were there ready to help us. Whether they are rickshaws or they are country boats for crossing river, rickshaws were carrying our stuff. By the 11th of December, the bulk of Pakistani forces west and south of the Padma River had been encircled. East of the Meghna River, the retreat of the troops for the defense of Dhaka had been cut off. Action at sea, too, was dramatic. The Pakistan Navy's only submarine, Ghazi, was in the Bay of Bengal, posing a threat to the aircraft carrier INS Vikrant. It was hunted down and sunk off Vishakhapatnam. Vice Admiral Roy. That was the only submarine that had the operational range to come to the Bay of Bengal, where Vikrant was. So we had a lot of stratagem planned. We made signals from uh, Vishakhapatnam to Madras for logistics, which is for an aircraft carrier, although the carrier was not there. The carrier was very safe down in the Andamans. But Ghazi homed on to Vishakhapatnam. We had the idea that she was somewhere in that area because she collected certain very important oil uh, on the way at uh, Colombo. She came down. And we had a strategy to see that Ghazi is contained. Vice Admiral Prakash on the ground heaped a sigh of relief. Ship like aircraft carrier which is a very big target. And in fact the whole honor of the Indian Navy was uh, crystallized in this one target. I received message straight away that Ghazi sunk. Now it was a tremendous relief. On land too. There was a master stroke. The second para battalion was para dropped on the afternoon of 11th of December in the Tangail area, cutting off the Pakistani 93 Brigade in the Maiman Singh sector from reinforcing Dhaka. The Mukti Bahini played a crucial role in making this area safe for para troops. A. Marshal Divan. The 7th American fleet was approaching the Bay of Bengal. It became imperative to finalize the fall of Dhaka. To achieve that, I felt that I must help the army in a bigger way and to quicken up the whole uh, process of marching towards Dhaka. The closest that the army uh, echelon uh, or the army advanced troops were, they were in the north. So we had uh, uh, used this paradox in the north of Dhaka, and this was then facilitated, the entire movement and the capture of Dhaka. On the 12th of December, Pakistani troops began to surrender in various sectors, and the Indian troops moved towards Dhaka from Tangail area in the north and Narsingdi in the east. All India Radio broadcast the first message by the Army Chief, General Manik Shaw, asking General Niazi to lay down arms as he was encircled and assured treatment as per the Geneva Convention. They were soldiers. They carried out their government's order. I had nothing against them. They fought. Well, they lost. Therefore, when they came in, I looked after them. I put them in barracks. They slept under cover. We haven't got enough barracks for everybody, for their 93,000 and my own troops. So my troops slept on the ground. On the 13th of December, elements of paratroops and the 95 Mountain Brigade reached Joybepur, a suburb of Dhaka. The next day, at 1.32 in the afternoon, President Yahya Khan authorized the East Pakistan governor to take all steps to end the fighting. The governor resigned after a crucial meeting. A. Marshal Divan described how the Indian Air Force pounded the governor's house when the meeting was in progress. We got hold of some tourist map from the nearby office and used that to locate the palace, locate the exact uh, room, and then we could not, the time being so short, we could not brief or tell the pilots who have participated, which is the room it is there. So I had ordered them to take off 
and carry on. On the evening of the 14th of December, General Niazi went to the U.S. Consul General to send a message to General Manikshaw asking for a ceasefire and safety of his troops. Manikshaw agreed, provided the Pakistan army surrendered to his advancing troops. General Jacob on the developments. As we landed, I was received by the Pakistan Army Chief of Staff, plus there were the foreign press, the whole lot of them, as well as the United Nations representatives who offered us their good services to negotiate. I felt that they had no role in the surrender, so I thanked them, and I then proceeded on towards Niazi's headquarters. We had a lot of trouble in reaching Niazi's headquarters. The fire, fighting was still going on in the bits of the town. We could hear the f firing, and Mukti Bihani stopped us, and they wanted to attack Niazi's headquarters. I told them Niazi was about to surrender, and there was no point in doing so. Though some fortified towns were holding out, the instrument of surrender was signed at the Dhaka Racecourse at 4.31 in the evening on the 16th of December. General Jacob arranged the surrender formalities. General Arora, who took the surrender, talks about that memorable event. I had decided that we take the surrender in public view. So that's why the, the surrender was taken on the Racecourse. And the public has gathered there in absolutely large numbers. And the surrender ceremony was first myself visiting my own troops, taking the way they provided the guard of honor, then the guard of honor provided by the Pakistan Army, and then we actually the signing of the surrender ceremony was taken in public view, which has had a tremendous effect on public. On the 16th of December, Prime Minister Indira Gandhi announced the unilateral ceasefire on the Western Front and the war was over. Bangladesh had come into being in the east, and more than 5,700 square miles of Pakistan territory in the Western Front lay in Indian hands. 70,000 defense and 2,000 paramilitary personnel had surrendered on the 12th of January, 1972. Sheikh Mujibur Rahman was sworn in as Prime Minister of Bangladesh. Our promise have been fulfilled. Today, a grateful nation remembers over 3,500 heroes who laid down their lives in that war. General Jacob pays a poetic tribute. What passing bells for these who die as cattle? Only the monstrous anger of the guns, only the stuttering rifles' rapid rattle can patter out their hasty horizons. No mockeries now for them, no prayers, no bells, nor any voice of mourning save the choirs, the shrill, demented choirs of wailing shells and bugles calling for them from sad shires. This year marks the 50th anniversary of Bangladesh's independence. Addressing the Bangladesh National Day program held in March this year, Prime Minister Narendra Modi, on behalf of all Indians, extended heartiest congratulations to all the citizens of Bangladesh.
दोनों पर समान रूप से लागू होती है अपने करोड़ों लोगों के लिए उनके भविष्य के लिए गरीबी के खिलाफ हमारे युद्ध के लिए आतंक के खिलाफ लड़ाई के लिए हमारे लक्ष्य एक है इसलिए हमारे प्रयास भी इसी तरह एकजुट होने चाहिए मुझे विश्वास है भारत बांग्लादेश मिलकर तेज गति से प्रगति करेंगे मैं एक बार फिर इस पावन पर्व पर बांग्लादेश के सभी नागरिकों को अनेक अनेक शुभकामनाएं देता हूं और हृदय से आप सभी का बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद करता हूं भारत बांग्लादेश मैत्री चिरोजीवी हो इन्हीं शुभकामनाओं के साथ मैं अपनी बात को समाप्त करता हूं जय बांग्ला जय हिंद You are listening to a special program commemorating the 50th anniversary of the Indian victory over Pakistan in 1971 and liberation of Bangladesh. This program was produced and presented by the News Services Division of All India Radio. You can listen to it on our mobile app News on AIR. This program is also available on our YouTube channel News on AIR Official. You may email your opinion about this program at airnsdtalks@gmail.com. Thank you.